Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. There are many plant societies and garden clubs. We'll talk about what they do and if joining one would help make you a better gardener. Also, squash are tasty and a great addition to any garden. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Susie Askew. Miss Susie is the president of the Memphis Hort Society. And Walter Battle is here. Walter Battle is a UT County Director in Haywood County. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Happy to be here. All right, Miss Susie. Let's talk about the benefits of plant societies, right? Because there are many plant societies here uh, in Shelby County and a lot of garden clubs as well. Right. Um, there's um, an umbrella organization called the Memphis Horticultural Society okay. that's been around since about 1980. And um, that group sort of covers everything. Their, their mission is to bring programming to the Mid-South area on gardening, um, lecture series is what it amounts to, and, it, okay. and there's no obligation other than paying your dues or paying each time you attend a lecture. It's the first Tuesday of every month, and each month the lecture changes. But um, below that are all the different plant societies where you concentrate on one type plant, and they go from hydrangea mm -hmm. to um, hosta, uh, African violet, orchid, you know, can almost name a plant group and there's a group of people that get together and study just that one plant, ferns, Yeah, for which instance. is pretty impressive when you think about that. So they meet every month or every few months also on a regular basis. Okay. And then you have garden clubs <laughs> and garden clubs um, are probably the most misunderstood of the group. I've been in a garden club as long as I've been in the Hort Society. Okay. They're, um, two affiliations. One is National Garden Clubs, which is the biggest gardening organization in the world. Wow. They actually have international affiliates. Okay. And in that National Garden Clubs, there are um, programming such as flower arranging, gardening, environmental and um, conservation groups, and also landscape design critics. So they have program schools that they offer in their membership. Okay. And they're also uh, much, very much concerned with scholarship and the next generation. And then there's um, um, Garden Club of America, which has two affiliates in Memphis. And they too have um, programming that concerns gardening, flower arranging, conservation, okay. scholarship. They're having a flower show next month. The National Garden Clubs is having a Deep South meeting here <laughs> next Monday and they're um, having a flower show too. So most people think about them as flower show groups, but they actually have a broad interest in, in uh, gardening. Okay, and many of them I'm sure have speakers as well. They right? do. And uh, a lot of people think you have to, um, it's hard to get in, it's not. You just have to find the right fit. Right, right. You have yeah. to, um, I'm in a club that meets at night and I've been in it since 1980. Wow. It's a small group, that. it's 12 women because that's about how many you can fit in your living room right. or cook for. Right. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but um, we, stu we don't have outside speakers, we just take a topic and study it for the whole year. Last year we did trees and um, we learned four new trees every month. So um, each club has a different bend according to what they're interested in. And a lot of them are looking for members and need new members to resupply because we're an aging group. Right. Uh, we also have garden clubs that have men in them, which is a population <laughs> we should now consider. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, so um, and explore the garden club world. And it's a nice, um, Simple, easy study, but it's also a friendship you develop, just like in Master Gardeners. You learn the basics and you also uh, make good friends. And that's sort of what all of us are in gardening about. That's right, that's right. Now tell me this, how do you go about choosing though one of these societies or garden clubs to actually be in? Well, I suggest with the Memphis Horticultural Society you attend a few meetings. Uh -huh. Um, on that first Tuesday of the month, the topic changes. You're there for uh, one hour from seven to eight is the lecture. And you listen to um, nationally known speakers mm -hmm. from all over the country that we bring in on various subjects. We just had Bree Arthur, who is a young mm -hmm. horticulturalist who taught us things that 
I didn't know were possible in gardening. She gardens in her landscape, in her um, in her foundation planting. She plants tomatoes in her hydrangeas right. to grow up them. And so she she had a wonderful um, presentation about gardening and, and foodscaping. Okay. But um, next month we have the head the, of the um, Birmingham Botanic Garden talking about growing their native plant society down there and their native plant conference because mm -hmm. next fall we're going to sponsor a native plant conference. Okay. So we're going to learn how they do theirs so well and what we might incorporate in ours. Okay. Native plants, you know, big popular subject these days, right? Isn't it though? It's, mm. uh, it's those plants, uh, they're not necessarily easier to grow but they were here once in abundance and we're losing them. And when we lose those, we lose their pop yep. population of pollinators. Yeah. And we also sort of lose our identity as a sense of place. Hmm. Um, so the way to look at that, yeah. lose your identity. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Now how do we go about, you think, uh, to attract you know, some of the younger generation into these plant societies and garden clubs? Well, they need to feel a part of it and then we need to have topics that they're interested uh. in. Uh, in January, we had 10 young um, horticulturalists, gardeners that um, were on a panel discussion and their uh, their interests are really aligned with ours in a lot of mm -hmm. ways. They like to know more about um, native plants and they're interested in foodscaping. Uh -huh. And those are two topics we are too. Um, their time um, is very valuable and they want to come out for a quality program. Sure. And so we've got to make sure what we're offering them is worth the time they take off to attend. Okay. Um, and we also need to listen to them about what they're interested in and get them involved with the program in itself. We, we need them as officers, we need them on committees. Um, their involvement is vital for us to keep going. Wow, important stuff. So if you're in the uh, Hosta Society, Hydrangea Society, or what I'm in you, both those two. And you're in both of those, <laughs> I know, as well. Did you, do you actually become experts, though? I don't yeah. think so. I think you garner a little bit every time you attend. Yeah. You get a different take on it. Uh, I would never be able to learn all the botanical names. Oh, and I'm the with hostas you there. are just, I'm with you. they're just oh. coming on so fast I can't keep up with them. But what you learn to do is like, I specialize now in miniature hostas. Okay. I only grow the little ones and I grow them in containers and that's manageable because I'm thinking in my next stage of life, I may be in an <laughs> apartment and I can take them with me. Mm. I can grow them on a patio if I have them in a container. Okay. So um, with hydrangeas, I just think they're beautiful yes, and they're a so great I. design plant, but I, I'm interested in those and how you make space with them and how you use them to the best of their attributes. Okay. Now you mentioned briefly the Master Gardeners. Walter knows a little mm -hmm. bit about that, of course I do. So what, you know, what about being a Master Gardener? How do you feel about that? I think it's really important for the people that are interested in learning to get a basic course in everything. Ah, and Master like Gardeners that. gives you the, the base yes. and lets you, after you've finished the course, you then realize, well, my interest is in this or that, mm -hmm. and you can follow that interest. But it's a great um, introduction to the world of gardening. And if you've been gardening as long as I have <laughs> and were to take the course, then you find out all the things you've forgotten or didn't know to begin with. So it's a, it's a great place to start or to go back and refresh. Great endorsement for the Master Gardener mm -hmm. program. Thank you, Ms. Susie. We appreciate that good information. And we do hope that the younger generation comes in and be a part of a lot of these plant societies as well and garden clubs too. Thank you. So thank you. Variegated. Yeah, you know, variegated. Yeah, that's that's a term that uh, we use to describe coloration of the mm -hmm. leaves. And a lot of people think variegated just means white, but it not or cream colored. But it could be other colors in the leaves as well. Is usually a lack or a lessening of the chlorophyll or the green pigment. Mm -hmm. You know, but typically it means the white coloration. You know, of the leaves, and that doesn't actually uh, commonly happen in nature. So it, we manipulate things to make the variegation come out. And a lot of times uh, we lose the variegation of some plants when we bring them out in full sun mm. or mm. shade. It could be either one. I've got some variegated bamboo wow. okay. that wow. only has the variegation in the sun. If I grow it in the shade, it loses its variegation. Hmm. Hostas are a big. Well, hostas, yeah, right. hostas sure, have, sure. you know, really pretty variegation. Mm -hmm. So many sure cultivars do. of hostas. But... Uh, I had a, uh, a plant one time that came out with, it was a variegated plant, 
and it came out with one stem that was purely white. Hmm. And as long as it was on that plant, you know, it grew. Hmm. And I thought, I'm going to try to propagate that. Well, you know what happened? It died because there was no chlorophyll in the leaves. Ah, okay. So it couldn't produce what it needed to root because there was no chlorophyll. All right, Walter, let's talk a little bit about squash. And I see you have some on the table for us to, uh, to look at, right? Oh, yes. Uh, you know, uh, of course, everybody knows <laughs> the yellow squash. Right. I mean, it's, it's been with us for a long, long time. Um, and basically, these uh, yellow squash come basically in two different cultivars, I guess, if you want to use that word. Uh, you have what we call the, the summer crookneck, mm -hmm. uh, and also you have the yellow summer straight neck. And as you can see, the difference is that this is obviously you know straight, and, right. and this has a little bit curved. Now, uh, these used to really, the breeders have kind of bred the, the curve out because uh, think about it in a store, they would break and all of that mm. would be easy to break them. So they've, really the crook neck is kind of getting straight, as you can see. <laughs> uh, so I guess I somewhere, some plant breeder has crossed yeah. <laughs> these into these and they're kind of getting that result okay. as well. Oh, these uh, plant breeders, huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, they're coming up with something yeah, all the time. Really. Um, and then of course, uh, we have our zucchini squash. Um, and, uh, you know, you have uh, these green zucchini, and you have a black zucchini, which gets very, 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 very dark green. Um, now, one thing I would like to share people, uh, tell people about squash is this. You need to pick your squash when they are probably about, I guess, about five inches like this. Because if you do not pick this plant when it's like this, come back two days later, and this thing is probably easily a foot long. <laughs> and, you know, therefore it'll be tough, and mm -hmm. no one will want to use it. And I think they make zucchini bread uh -huh. with uh -huh. it when it gets to that point. Uh, or you can feed it to the hogs if you got some hogs. <laughs> uh, you know, hog, hey, hogs love squash, trust me on that. Uh, I like squash also. And then there's another squash that we see a lot in the stores called a little white squash, the little patty pan mm -hmm. squash. It's kind of round. Uh, and some of them are kind of shaped a little bit like a sunflower, you know, with the little ridges uh -huh. around it. Uh, and, uh, and they're fun to grow also. They grow well here in, in, in our climate. Okay. Now, what about the winter squash? Yes, uh, th there are two different types. Obviously, today we was talking about this, the summer varieties. But, yes, you do have the winter squash, which would be your acorn squash, your spaghetti squash, mm -hmm. your butternut squash, yeah. uh, and I'm sure there's some others. Uh, and those tend to grow well. We, we plant them more in the fall of the season mm -hmm. is when, you know, those tend to get planted to be harvested in, in, in the fall. Uh, but they are uh, very delicious as well. Okay. Uh, yes. So what type of squash grows best for us in West Tennessee? Well, pretty much uh, the, the yellow yeah, okay. squash, or the yellow crook neck, the yellow straight neck, uh, the zucchini squash grow well. Uh, here in our climate. Also, the patty pan squash grows well. And those winter squash that I just mentioned, they grow all right okay. in our climate as well. Yeah, but if you're going to grow them, you're going to need what, Miss Susie? Space. Yes, you need right? space. So what about that? Okay, well, basically, uh, for squash, I like to, to, I like to have about a four, uh, a four foot apart okay. on the rows because they will put out and just you know, it's just spread all over the place. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to remember, they are a member of the cucurbit family, mm -hmm. which include pumpkins and watermelons and cantaloupes. So these things love to get out and put out vines. Yes. Uh, that's <laughs> what they love to do. And I also plant them about two feet apart uh, in plants. So you have, you know, four feet wide as far as your row length and then two feet apart per plant. And you usually can do okay, okay. Uh, with them that way. All right. Then when should they be planted? Okay, I like to plant them basically um, around uh, from about May 1 through throughout June. Uh, okay. They'll be fine. Uh, the soils are good and warm to plant them. Now, obviously, you can plant them a little earlier if you use transplants. You know, you can get them out there a little earlier maybe. Uh, and if you want to cover them up with, you know, buckets and things like that, <laughs> just in case we have some kind of late frost event or something like that. But basically, you can plant them all the way up through uh, June easily, June 30th easily. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, we always talk about crop rotation, right, in our vegetable garden. So, yes. 
Which of the cucurbits, specifically the squash, follow in that crop rotation? Well, uh, well, you know, you, you really don't want to follow uh, a cucurbit crop with another cucurbit right. crop okay. because those diseases, I mean, if there's ever a family that will be attacked by the same diseases and insects, it's the cucurbit mm -hmm. family. So if you had watermelons in the spot, you wouldn't want to put uh, squash there right. this year. Uh, if, uh, but you would want to plant your squash probably in a place where you may have had corn last year, hmm. uh, where maybe you had uh, your green beans last year. You might want to put it there where you had your sweet, sweet potatoes last year. You would just want to put, put, put squash in those uh, areas. Okay. And you'll be fine. All right. Well, since you mentioned it, uh, what about the major insect pests and diseases? Oh, oh man. squash. <laughs> uh, now, I will tell you, squash has its enemies. Oh, yes. The cucumber beetle, mm -hmm. uh, the squash bug, the, the vine borer, the squash Which is the one we hear borer. about a lot. Yes, yeah. that, that, I would probably call that the number one uh, pest yeah. of squash. Uh, and, and, and what you see there is one day your squash vines will just be beautiful and gorgeous. And then all of a sudden you come back the next day and they just like wilted. Yeah, just collapsed. Down to the ground. Right. Yes, and that's just where the squash borer has gotten in there and he's just bored all into that base of that plant and disrupted all those, uh, the, you know, the nutrients mm -hmm. and stuff going up, and the plant dies. Now, uh, another pest uh, would be also aphids. <laughs> and the reason that aphids are a big problem with your squash plants is because they carry that mosaic virus. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and so if you see your squash vines begin to look like, uh, what, what they call that, zodiac or whatever, <laughs> you, know, right. you know, look real groovy, yeah. you know. Uh, <laughs> hey, hey, the problem you have there is really <laughs> you have the mosaic Right. Uh, virus is what you have, and it's not much you can do. It will even make the squash turn those colors as well, the fruit of the plant mm -hmm. it, itself. So you have to really control your aphids to control that disease. And another uh, big disease that they get, uh, they will get powdery mildew, powdery. and usually your uh, chlorothalonil products will clean that up uh, okay. and, and take care of it. But if uh, you know if the virus is there, it's not too much you can do about that virus, it's right? It's not much you yeah. can do about the virus. Just unfortunately, just Pretty much pull them up and hey, better luck next time. Wow. Uh, but you have to you have to control. That's why you have to control the aphids, aphids right. throughout your garden and throughout your landscape. Right. Because you know the aphid can be coming from somewhere else and transmitting that virus okay. to that squash. So you wouldn't even eat that squash if it, of course, had a virus, would you? Oh yes, I'll you definitely. would eat. Oh yeah, okay. I, I would eat that. It you would, would just okay. be a psychedelic type squash. <laughs> that <you have> there. <laughs> you know, probably be prettier in the, in the skillet. You know? uh, but it actually does look good when it has those little, you know, colors to them, right? <laughs> yes. All right, so look, how long, though, is that, you know, is the growing season for your squash? Oh, uh, well, really, uh, about six weeks uh, once, they, once they start producing. Yeah. Uh, and a key to really having a good uh, productive squash season, uh, growing season, is you really need to harvest them when they're like, you know, you know, again, you know, three or four inches. You want to just constantly pick them, and then they'll, they'll put on those new blooms, and the pollinators will be taking care of business, and, and you'll just have a, a pretty good uh, supply of squash. And let, let me tell you, folks, it don't <laughs> take much squash to, 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 to grow a lot. I mean, they're heavy producers if they're in the right areas. Right, so what, just a couple of plants, you think? Can you oh, enough, easily. Yeah. Uh, I, I may say four, maybe four. Okay. Uh, and, and, and also, if you, don't, if you do not plant, uh, pick them, whenever they're small, they'll end up becoming those big squash, and that just makes that plant spend all that energy trying to keep up that big fruit. Right. So that's, that's kind of knocking off time on your harvest as well. Right. All right, Walter, we can tell you like squash. Oh, yes, I love it. <laughs> hey, you can fry it or whatever, or boil it, whatever, I'll eat it. All right, well, appreciate you getting information about squash. Yes. All right. At the end of the growing season, which is usually late fall or early winter, it's always a good idea to winterize your holes. So what does that mean? Well, number one, you want to make sure that you disconnect the hose or detach it from the spigot. Second thing you want to do is you want to make sure that you get all of the water out of the hose because when water freezes, of course it's going to expand and that may cause your hose to burst. So the hump that I am creating here is allowing the water to actually drain downhill. So once we get that done, then we can coil it, we can bring it inside our garage or our storage areas for the winter. 
All right, this is our Q&A session. Miss Susie, you help us out, all right? Here's our first viewer email, which has a picture. My sister received this plant when her husband passed recently. Uh, she loves plants, however, this plant had no tag and we have no idea what it is or how to care for it. Can it be planted outdoors? And this is from Miss Joy. So, Miss Susie, what do we think that is? Well, um, that plant is called China Doll mm -hmm. and it's a tropical plant and it's grown for its foliage. It's got beautiful leaves, shiny, mm -hmm. and so it would need to be treated as a house plant. Okay. It would need to be cared for just like you would any house plant, repotted when it's too pot bound, put in indirect light, but good light, and watered when it needs it with the um, um, reserve. And it also, we forget on house plants, we need to fertilize them. Uh. Yeah, a good balanced true. fertilizer. In this case, because it's grown for its foliage, right. it would need a particular foliage um, balanced fertilizer. Uh, and she should be able to keep it for years, but you can't just leave it and water it and expect it to be um, flourishing. It needs to be cared for. Okay. How often uh, should you fertilize, you think? Uh, I use a half solution, a real weak solution, so I can fertilize every week. Uh -huh. When okay. um, uh, and it depends on if it's a foliage-grown right. plant or if it's a flowering plant. The other thing, uh, a simple thing to do, is turn it every time you water it, so mm. it ke keeps looking round rather than flat. Ah, that's something to think about. Right. I hadn't mentioned that before. Okay, but definitely indoor. 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 Mm -hmm. Tropical. Mm -hmm. I've seen it a lot in the florist trade, of yeah. course. Uh, but it's a beautiful plant, you know, the yeah. glossy green leaves. It's uh, a nice yeah. memorial plant, too, because mm -hmm. you, you can keep it alive for a long time. Okay. All right. But indirect, like we want folks exactly. to know that. Indirect. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. So there you have it, Miss Joyce. China doll. How about that beautiful, beautiful plant? All right. Here's our next viewer email. I have common Bermuda grass. When is the best time to scout Bermuda grass? And how much of the existing grass do you recommend be removed? And this is from Richard over in Collierville. So he has Bermuda grass. What's the best time to scalp? I would, how do you feel about <laughs> well, scalping you know, Bermuda grass? Yes, you know, most turf grass people will tell you <laughs> never to scalp it. Right? Uh, but there are people who do it. Okay. And, and, and obviously they do it with athletic fields sometimes because it will force it to knit. Okay. It'll make it, you know, have that tight knit. So obviously on the athletic field, you would want that. Um, but I was always told you never take off more than a third mm -hmm. of, the, of the grass, of right. the plant. Right. And that's just kind of the rule that I always use in, in, in my own yard and also at the office. Just never take off more, you know, over a third. Right. That's just kind of the rule that, that I kind of go with. All right. So I know a couple of guys that actually will scout. Okay. They are at the beginning of the growing season. Okay, and this is pretty much, you know, in April, the first couple of weeks in April. Mm -hmm. They do it to remove the dead grass. Actually makes a little sense, right? Because, okay, okay yes. the sun will warm that soil up a little quicker, which helps that Bermuda green up right. quicker. Okay? Um, you don't have to do that. I don't do it in my own lawn. I have a Bermuda lawn. It seems to do fine every year without being scapped. Uh, but if you have to do it, again, of course, mm -hmm. you know, the first couple of weeks in April to remove the dead grass. And I probably will fertilize it. Also, mm -hmm. to make it kick, you know, kick up and go head on and go. Right. You know, after being scalped. Right. You know. And of course, you know, this would be right at the, you know, the green up transition period. Yes. Yeah. So again, the soil gets warmed up, the Bermuda jumps up. Yes. It's gonna jump up anyway. It's Bermuda. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. That's what it does. It's coming anyway. Yes. All right. So there you have it, Mr. Richard. All right. Here's our next viewer email. Should for Cynthia be pruned of dead branches or just tidied up and fertilized? And this is from Miss Elizabeth. By Helia, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. So, Miss Susie, can we just prune out the dead branches sure. and just tidy it up just a little bit? Yeah, sure. Right. Prune out the dead branches every year. That's just okay. being good to the plant. It, and um, then you need to decide what pruning shape you want. Do uh -huh. you want the natural with the long, weeping um, fronds that are really beautiful, or some people want it uh, rounded and more controlled? Uh -huh. yeah. and, it's your choice, and you right. you are in control of the pruners. That's right. So, uh, I've seen it used as hedges. I've um, um, 
I've seen a hole cut out so you could make a passageway through them. They were so thickly grown, and then I've seen them as the as we call meatballs across the <laughs> landscape. Right. So that's just a personal preference, but uh, be good to it by taking out the dead branches. Taking out the dead branches. They okay. they, they don't need those. Okay. Uh, anything that's crossing, maybe rubbing. Crossing, or rubbing, them? diseased. Even though I don't think it has too many enemies, it's pretty healthy. I don't, I, I don't, I don't think so as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think so. And then since you mentioned pruning, when is the best time to prune for Cynthia? Uh, I would prune it after it blooms. Ah, after? Okay. But um, it's such a tough plant, you can just about prune it any time you want to. <laughs> okay. Um, you'll be removing the buds and the, um, the future bloom on it at some point. Sure. So. Um, you'll have to make that decision, but it's such a harbinger of spring. It, it just is. Signal, oh, signals yeah. to us all, it's coming, it'll be here soon. That's right, yes. that's right. And yeah. it, it's a really tough, good plant. Right, and it's pretty much one of the first blooming shrubs mm -hmm. that you see, you know, in the early spring, yes. you know, for the most part, or late winter in Shelby County, it just depends. <laughs> yeah. All right, Walter, anything to add to that? No, that's that's pretty much it. I, I know I have it at my own house, and I, I chose just to just let it go mm -hmm. in its natural way, and it is beautiful. I'm a flower arranger, so I love oh. those arches, mm -hmm. and I cut those and bring them in to okay. put in the vases. All right, it's good to see something else you could do for Cynthia, yeah. Miss Elizabeth. So there you have it. All right, so Miss Susie, Walter, we're out of time. That was fun. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplots at wkno.org. And the mailing address is Family Plot 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. If you would like more information on squash or help finding a local plant society, visit familyplotgarden.com. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plots Gardening in the Mid South. Be safe.